Hello, in this uh, lesson, lesson number four, we will continue and the name of this lesson is the beautiful body and the sublime body. Uh, this lesson will present Logier's proposal of aesthetics as an emotional need and questions the notions of beauty. Burke argues that the body needs all emotions, either bright or dark, and introduces the notion of the sublime. Burke refers to human emotion and aesthetical experience as a consequence of corporeal experience. The embodied architecture evolves from the Baroque church to the National Library. So as a comparison between these uh, two different kinds of paradigm which are expressed through the building. So by the middle of the 18th century, we are starting in the middle of the 18th century now, Rousseau's ideas on the origins of man had inspired Logier, a former Jesuit who had been assigned to sermon at King Louis XIV, but ending up being expelled and exiled for his comments on the king's political and personal excesses. His interest on architecture came from his disgusts on the Rococo, which went against the sobriety of Jesuit thinking, and he considered Vitruvio's work as irrelevant, as it showed only the architectural possibilities of this time. Logier believed that architecture was based upon the supreme criterion of reason and the unique human faculty of being able to fabricate objects with the intent of preserving himself against the perils of nature or extend the life of his uh, provisions. So you might have heard about uh, Marc-Antoine Logier. He made also this very famous drawing of the uh, primitive cabin or cabin primitive uh, refuge, the Urhute. That was his um, idea in his uh, essay on architecture from 1755. So please check uh, uh, figure 4.1. It's this one here. This is Logier's drawing, oops, I'm sorry for the reflection, of the primitive uh, cabin. So you see it's a very uh, archetypal image of uh, a feature like, like a portico and then um, this uh, archetypal, archetypal definition of a roof in a triangular shape uh, only made with logs, logs of wood. So this idea of the the primal, the primal ch shelter, the primal uh, cabin. Picking up Rousseau's ideas on primitive man, who was supposedly an uncorrupted being, relying only on his instincts, Logier brings to us a narrative in which the first architectural elements that appear are the columns and tablature and roof so this triangle motive, as the result of the assembling of four fallen branches into the ground, connecting them with some more as horizontal limbs, and then adding some inclined branches with leaves to form a gabled canopy. So Logier creates this story or this fable that primitive man in the forest, having only trees, has this idea of picking up the fallen branches of, of the trees and making a shelter for himself, first with the fallen branches as a structure. So the columns, the entablature, the entablature, and then of course the roof. And as a result of the four walls covering with the other branches with foli foliage, so having this uh, idea of, of uh, foliage as a kind of cladding of, of the wall, so not just a structure but of, of a wall as a continuous surface, almost as a fabric, we'll have it later with uh, Gottfried Semper, almost as a fabric that makes uh, the walls enclosed and makes this feeling of uh, shelter. Logier's fable pins down the moment when human intelligence relying on instinct, makes a decision to create an alternative to a damp cave as a shelter for his body, relying only on these simple elements. 
So you can take a look also at figure 4.2. It's also from Marc Antoine Laugier, uh, Le Temple des Sauvages. So the Temple of the Savages. And here is an example of how the temple would look like. In this case, not just an entablature, but also another feature, a little bit like a dome in reference probably to the human skull and the cladding of the walls using uh, vegetation. So that was Logia's description of the, the temple of the savage. Walls, windows and doors follow as extra necessities in this fable. So walls, windows and doors are not essential for Logier. What was in essential for the primitive cabin was really the structure. Uh, an ornament is condemned as license, so as not, not an important uh, aspect, as well as arches, pilasters, engaged columns and other elements which can't be supported by reason, or one would say analytical thoughts. So you remember on the lesson before, we, we talked about uh, uh, rationalism in France. So of course, Logier still follows this uh, idea that in architecture or in construction, anything which does not follow reason, reason, reason or logical explanation uh, coming from analytical thought is not necessary and it's even uh, aesthetically and morally wrong. So for Logier, architectural beauty comes from these essential qualities, which derive mostly from a function. And in his essay on architecture, he also refers as the second principle of his theory to the concept of dégagement, meaning openness. Pirot is often quoted, especially his work on the colonnade of the Louvre's east wing facade, although Logier doesn't agree on the virtues of his concept of apprêté or visual tension and the way this is related to visual apprehension of the picturesque from a physiological perspective. So Logier was interested in Pirot, about whom we talked uh, in the lesson uh, before. But still, at the same time, uh, he disagreed. Uh, he disagreed with his ideas on visual tension, and um, he was more interested also in developing this idea of of the archetypal uh, shelter. So this concept would have even more attention in the future. By the end of the 18th century, interest in classical architecture continued to flourish especially in France, England and Germany, where societies of dilettanti or the dilettants started to organize expeditions to look for real architectural traces of the past instead of simply relying on old images or illustrations, which were more an interpretation of the text than exact reproductions of the style. So the dilettanti, um, for example, there's here and please take a look at figure 4.3. It's a painting by Sir Joshua Reynolds, members of the Society of the Dilettanti from 1734. Uh, and nowadays when we say a dilettante, we think about someone who, you know, spends a lot of time just having fun and not really doing much. But at the time, the dilettanti, they were they were not exactly the traditional scholars because they were somehow not not really conventional academics, um, but they were scholars who were interested in learning, not just by reproductions, like before in the lessons before we saw, for example, the interpretations of Vitruvian uh, orders by Leonardo da Vinci, Cesare Cesariano, also later by, of course, by Alberti, by Claude Perrault, um, but these were always interpretations based on, on the texts. Although Alberti in this way had an advantage because he was in Italy, so he had access to direct access through traveling to the source. But still, the idea of the, of the society of the dilettanti was to travel, 
to visit the remains of the buildings and also because many um, buildings were discovered because of the birth of uh, archaeology. So there was a lot of new things to, to see and to understand about architectural history that did not come only from descriptions and that could be seen by observation. Um, and so most of these studies were done through travel and through drawing and painting. So these trips to visit architecture were motivated on one side by the scientific curiosity typical of the enlightened mind. So this was the time of the enlightenment, the philosophical movement. On the other, by the growing interest in ancient cultures. So not just classical, uh, the classical um, architecture and heritage like ancient Greece and ancient Rome, but also, of course, Egypt. The desire to travel and observe, collect and study foreign, specim foreign specimens was also one of the motivations for these expeditions. Natural sciences would evolve immensely from the direct contact with the wilder nature and this would also change the views on the origins of uh, humans and potentially the cosmos. This curiosity would also lead to the study of culture as an expression of the environment and planted the seeds of what would become anthropology. And since the invention of photography would come only later, the records of these travels were all done through sketches, drawings and paintings. It was particularly through the drawings of a young man named Julien David Leroy that Perrault's earlier hypothesis that the Greeks had evolved the proportions of their buildings over time gained ground. So Perrault had already this, uh, this uh, intuition that the proportions of, of Greek buildings were not fixed. It was something that developed over time but it was a theory that there was no proof about it and then julien david leroy went to travel and to visit uh, these buildings and through paintings drawings and careful observation he could confirm some of uh, perrault's um, ideas and and uh, uh, theories on, on the proportions of the building. So please take a look at figure 4.4. Uh, this is a drawing uh, from Julien de Villeroy, and it's a drawing of a Greek ruin from uh, 1770. And you see, it's a little bit an uh, idealized uh, landscape, but it's meant to work as a, as a, as a photograph and now we also can see it a little bit like a postcard, although at the time this didn't this didn't exist. But we can also make the connection of how um, this was the beginning of traveling for curiosity and learning by visiting other cultures, other buildings, and also this new style of representation of what I see and what I select in my travels and how how do I display this uh, to the world. So Leroy was a painter who, being outside the circles of wealthy dilettanti, so he didn't really grow up to be, uh, grow to be with dilettanti, he adventured himself and spent three months in Athens on his own. His well-sponsored contemporaries, Stuart and Revit, had been in Rome and Athens before, but didn't manage to bring with them any sketches on the major works of classical architecture. So these were two British colleagues who were also there, but they didn't get the same results uh, he did. Perhaps they had more means and were a little bit more distracted and he was more focused on the work. France's architectural community became shocked with the discovery of how different Greek architecture really was from the Roman and a hearty debate on which would be considered best started to take place. Leroy tried to establish a scientifically demonstrated idea of the superiority of the Greeks, probably because he was visiting Greece, considering specificities such as optical corrections for the sake of preserving the visual experience of harmonic proportions. 
so th this is an important point uh, here. So by observation, Le Roi could see that the proportions of Greek buildings are uh, are not uh, are, are visually not perfect. There there is a certain distortion in the perspective which you only can only notice by um, close observation uh, but this was meant they already understood perspective although perspective had not been of officially invented uh, but they understood the necessity for making optical corrections so so for example the columns are not straight as they seem they do have a kind of angle and this is meant so that while walking through the building, the eye perceives the building as perfectly symmetrical, perfectly orthogonal. But this this was an optical delusion. So this was one of the reasons why Le Roy found that such a sophisticated device in a, in a more ancient uh, culture could only be a sign of superiority from the Greeks. So on his opinion, also probably because uh, Le Roy was also French and very interested in, you know, like we spoke before in the lesson before, on the, um, on the tradition from the Gothic and how then in rationalism this clarity and simplicity of form and we would almost say nowadays uh, kind of minimalism, although it's a risky designation. So on his opinion, Greek architecture was simpler in style, and so better, more massive in its profiles and proportions, and more plastic in character. And that, that would make it su superior to Italian. Um, when I mean Italian in this way, of course, I'm not talking about the Baroque, I'm talking about ancient Rome. So antiquity, classical and antiquity. Um, I think it's important, so I will also add to you uh, so that you can see these connections, although now we are talking about the 18th century, but since we are doing these references to ancient Greece and ancient uh, Rome, although I know that you've already heard about this in architectural history uh, before, so this is the more advanced module. I, I assume that you already learned this. Um, but in any case, uh, when we learn about architectural history, we are always going back and forth in time because obviously in architecture and in design, we are always picking up the styles from the past, uh, understanding them and uh, reinterpreting them uh, to, the, to the future. Uh, according to the zeitgeist. So, um, so you will have also some information about um, classical, classical architecture from Greece, ancient Greece, and also from uh, ancient Rome, so that, that you can see uh, these connections. But uh, still on Julien de Villeroy, please take a look at uh, figure 4.5, it's actually two figures uh, together, uh, and it's a plan, uh, it's, it's two representations from um, Greece that he did, so a plan and elevation of the temple of Istria at Pola uh, in Greece. So the, draw the drawings are from 1758, and um, this is an interpretation of the temple and the Corinthian order. To see which, what which image I am referring to. So Le Roy would uh, side would stay by the uh, with Perrault and Logier, and argue that the Parthenon's beauty wasn't necessarily dependent on the proportions of its elements. So it was not only about the proportion. Le Roy believed that the scale and the play with the architectural elements, such as in the case of the colonnade, were of much more importance 
since they made a greater impact on the eye and so created a very strong impression in the brain. So you see that here there is also a very strong influence of Descartes. Descartes was very interested in the brain, but of course for Descartes the brain and, and, and the eye, since they are supposedly the closest connected, of course he did not have still the understanding of, of the whole nervous system, he only saw this connection with the optic nerve, which is directly connected to the brain. Um, and this idea that if it impresses the eye, then that's what's most important. So Leroy's belief comes also close to what could be a scientific explanation to the aesthetical experience of the sublime by relating the grandeur in a building with the physical sensations created by the things such as the vastness of the ocean, the immensity of the sky and the view from the top of a mountain. As an artist, Leroy understood the essential difference between the aesthetical experience of a painting and that of a work of architecture. So for, for Leroy, it was, it was already very clear that the experience of a building is not the same as the experience of a painting and, um, or, or a drawing. Because although he was very focused on the eye, he knew from perception that the experience does not have, wouldn't have the same complexity. So he compared the experience of a building to the impact one feels in one's body, in one's uh, sensation of this aesthetic experience of the sublime. And how do you define the sublime? How does he compare it? The grandeur of the vastness of the ocean, the immensity of the sky, and the view from the top of the mountain. So a building, a good building, should evoke these kind of qualities. While in painting, he ex Leroy explains, the artist must confine the elements in the space of the canvas and displace them in a self-created hierarchy so that the viewer is unconsciously drawn to the main objects. In architecture, the dweller has the possibility to explore the elements by choosing how to approach them being free of only visual restraints. The possibilities of interaction with these elements are only limited to the possibilities of the body who experiences it or some specific conditions of the surrounding environment to which it belongs to. So you see already this uh, thought about uh, architecture from experience. Uh, for this text, um, after I've, I finish these uh, lessons, I will also quote a text by, uh, from a book by uh, Harry Francis Malgrave, Professor Malgrave, who works for a long time on this topic of experience of architecture and his most recent book, From Object to Experience, articulates a lot of these, uh, a lot of these ideas and naturally makes makes a reference uh, to um, to these uh, historical to these uh, historical um, developments in theories of, of aesthetic and and so this text this text comes from my uh, doctoral dissertation so these lessons and these texts are really they are part of my doctoral um, dissertation but this uh, particular segment of text uh, is quoting uh, the work of Professor Mulgrave. So if you're curious, you can, you can already look, but we will, we will address his work as reference as part of your, also as part of your literature for this uh, course. So I re will repeat this thought again. The possibilities of interaction with these elements are only limited to the possibilities of the body who experiences it or some specific conditions of the surrounding environment to which it belongs to. Leroy goes on further to suggest that like in poetry, the architect guides the dweller through a series of sensations which are given through the placement of the elements. So you remember in one of the far, in one of the other lessons when we spoke about the Baroque that I already described you a little bit to think about this image. 
how do the architectural elements move me? How does this uh, happen? And this later would also be a question that uh, another big name in architecture would pose, Le Corbusier, would be specifically interested what what makes a space move me. So how these sensations are interpreted for Le Roy as, as emotions is a secret lying under the mind's capacity of constructing meaning through experience. And one can suggest by following Le Roy's logic in Logier's physiological attempts to classify the experience of architecture, that design can be a calculated form of neurological play. What does this mean? It means that already there, there was this intu intuition that perhaps when we design, we are composing the experience of the person who is going to experience this space. And we do this through form, through elements, and also through the narrative, to, through the story that the building tells. So in a way, when we are designing, um, we are triggering the body through stimulus, and these are processed, of course, by our neurons, but also our somatic body, our, our sensations. It wasn't only in France that the debate on the reasons for the aesthetical experience of beauty as a result of natural human faculties was alive. As referred to before, other big cities in Europe had their own great philosophers and in England, John Locke's influence was of particular importance. Locke's empiricist's proposal focuses on a view of sensations as essential to mental reasoning and the individual's construction of a world view. Sensationalism wasn't addressed as one of the main topics of Locke's discussion, but still, on the 1700s edition of his essay on human understanding, the topics of harmony and proportion would be addressed as deeply interconnected with the workings of the brain. This view would also be extended by the Scottish David Hume, who defended that beauty wasn't necessarily related to the properties of objects themselves, but to the mind's capacity for associating ideas, which depend in turn from acquired memories on experiences of pleasure. Which means that to Hume, each brain possesses its own idea of beauty based on the different subjective experiences that each individual forms through life. Still, Hume also acknowledges that if two subjects cultivate their minds in a similar way, they will nurture the same kind of feelings towards the contemplated objects and so share an aesthetic affinity. This would be one of the possibilities for the appearance of a particular style as the reflection of culture in a specific time and context. But Hume also states that in spite of the role of subjectivism in aesthetical experience, it is possible that there are cultural invariants, which probably are accepted by the brain in an almost universal way, and that these come from natural and not only acquired or learned, nurtured properties of the human body. This is a very important point here. So Hume talks about aesthetic and we are, when we reference aesthetic here, we are always putting it in the context of architecture. So Hume talks about this idea of beauty and how the definition of a style comes when two people or a community develops a sense um, or, or is uh, cu and cultured in a similar way so that it develops an affinity to find beauty in the same things, to enjoy the same things and find beauty in them. And for Hume, 
this is a reflection of the culture and it has to do with the context. But Hume also makes this proposal that although this is probably real and explains why there was a French style and an Italian style and perhaps a Greek style, that there are cultural invariants, so that there are patterns of aesthetic and of form that seem to appear in different cultures and also in different times. And that maybe there is some kind of natural or biological disposition for us to find them beautiful. And this probably has to do, that was already Hume, uh, Hume's proposal, with the properties of the human body itself and with the patterns we observe in, in the forms of nature. So this would explain the prevalence of certain forms, proportions, geometrical harmonies and the use of the golden section, the section aurea, in different cultures and historical periods. After Hume, the Irish philosopher Burke would reaffirm in 1757 on his philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful. Perrault's physiological concerns for emotional reactions to which he calls organs of the mind in order to find some invariable and certain laws for the matter of, of taste. Um, so Burke was very interested in Perrault, Claude Perrault's physiological concerns, and he wanted to find um, he wanted to find how do the organs of the mind find certain patterns, what he called invariable and certain laws, um, recurrent, that we tend to say are good taste. So in his book, Burke puts the concept of the sublime at the same level of uh, importance as the one of beauty, but they are different beauty and sublime, but still taking a rather Cartesian, so influenced by Descartes, opposition between both uh, contexts, uh, concepts. So there is for Burke a clear distinction between what's beautiful and what's sublime. And for Burke, beauty has to do with harmony and pleasure, and sublime has to do with perhaps what's even grotesque, what's disturbing, what's emotionally very affecting, but also ecstatic. So for Burke, if beauty can be defined by what is delicate, smooth, small, clear and bright, the sublime is represented by what is dark, obscure, dangerous and even horrifying. For Burke, these feelings of terror magnitude, power, infinity, difficulty and magnificence are as necessary as their peaceful counterparts for a healthy human existence, breaking the monotony of the day-to-day, -day, what could be considered as a, a rather contemporary view on the subject of emotional health through a diversified sensory uh, stimulation. So Burke was already intrigued by this notion that uh, of course, we need harmony and stability and uh, comfort in our life, but we also need, since we are hu human beings, have a vast emotional range, we also have the need for strong sensations, for um, um, even for um, experiences of difficulty, of power, of fear and, and uh, of uh, even of uh, danger. So these are all aspects of, of uh, human uh, experience and we experience these uh, things uh, through, through life. Otherwise, obviously, life is boring. And Burke um, 
puts this uh, puts this in the context of aesthetics and of course in the context of uh, architecture so not only it's desirable to have buildings who have always a very clear harmonious structure but it's also necessary to have buildings that somehow affect our senses that somehow disturb our our sense of uh, balance and that somehow create this kind of um, drama and stimulation that we need uh, also to live um, to existentially fulfill our all our emotional range uh, in the world so burke treated the vitruvian tradition so classical tradition with great suspicion if not contempt and proposed a theory not so different from Leroy's on the role of the diversity of the disposal of architectural elements and especially on the intentional play with contrasts such as horizontal with vertical elements, light and shadow, to cause impact and the experience of sudden changes in the dweller as successive sensations. Le Corbusier later would perhaps recall Burke's thoughts about the play of light and matter brought together by mass this in the 20th century we will arrive to the 20th century and we will talk also about Le Corbusier but we make already here a parallel because Le Corbusier was also very interested in this creating balance between harmony uh, and uh, sensations of the sublime Although, as you, we will discuss later, Le Corbusier was also, in a way, a kind of Cartesian dualist uh, figure who had either a very rationalist, pragmatist side and a very emotional, uh, expressionist uh, side. But, but we, will get, we will get there. So this tension is for Burke the physiological source of emotions. As the, and now it's a citat, the muscles of the eye relax while contemplating a beautiful object and contract at the, uh, and contract at the sight of the sublime. So his theory was when we see something beautiful, our eyes relax, and they enjoy this beautiful. And when we see something sublime, they contract. And so it is in this balance between relaxation and tension that the uh, healthy, emotionally satisfying experience uh, of, of an architectural space exists. A psychophysiological approach, so his interpretation of, um, of, of uh, the aesthetical experience of a building is psychophysiological. Uh, and this psychophysiological approach is surprisingly contemporary. And it suggests that human emotion and aesthetical experience arise out of our corporeal experience. In other words, the neurological processing of physical perceptions. The interest on the sublime brought along the interest on the picturesque. Whereas a classical symmetrical building would be considered beautiful, a Gothic building would be sublime. The theme of the garden was of particular importance and it is specifically related to the notion of movement already vastly explored in Baroque churches and especially during the Rococo. So the design of the garden, and here we are talking about the 18th, 18th century, especially the, the English uh, garden, is already, and this idea of the picturesque, um, already shows uh, this uh, desire to create through the landscape and through through the through the natural uh, elements or through this artificial constructed uh, landscape to create situations of mystery of play where one could perhaps feel a little bit uh, lost and uh, or having surprise uh, a, su a surprise uh, encounter not knowing exactly and clearly where where one is so having this kind of sensation of of um, of sublime idea of sublime related to the notion of movement so not a clear movement but a, 
a more uh, organic uh, exploratory kind of, of movement which in a way picks up the idea of movement from the Baroque and from the Rococo which of course was also very interested in this sensation what, what moves the body by the last quarter of the 18th century the debate on Greco-Roman architecture as well as the reception of Piranesi's representation of Italian archaeological findings led to a change in taste. I'm sorry because now it became a little bit dark but I, I think you can still uh, see me. Um, so to, to have a notion of the picturesque um, this is a little bright okay now it's better to have a notion of, of the picturesque please take a look at figures 4.6 and 4.7 where you have two um, true drawings from uh, Piranesi Piranesi was of course very influenced by uh, by the drawings um, through travel also of, of uh, ancient ruins from uh, ancient Greece and ancient Rome but he created with these architectural uh, classic architectural repertoire he created his own uh, fantastical landscapes and these landscapes are um, they are stories they are narratives and they have of course this experiential uh, quality uh, so they, they tell a story but they also have a lot of, of detail and sometimes some paradoxical um, elements but they really explore this idea of the sublime and uh, of places which which could even trigger sensations of perhaps fear and and uh, uneasiness and uh, tension so for example in figure 4.6 this is a, a plate from the Cartieri, so uh, a dungeon, a prison. We have here the Cartieri. He did many on the Cartieri, but this this is one of the most uh, known. Um, and you can see in this image that this this uh, mood of of a dungeon with these staircases and bridges and so, something that looks like it could be some kind of underworld where people are um, working but it's at the same time very mysterious we there's illusions to we can make a story but we cannot make the story very very clearly um, so there is this idea of storytelling but there's also of course uh, this idea of, of the sublime which is also created by um, constructing with a narrative or a story and an image that we can't completely understand at the same time that has a certain level of mystery. So even the standards on the aesthetical appreciation of female beauty would of course at this time also also change. Um, this is a bit of a feminist uh, comment um, but of course uh, this this uh, this is also subjective uh, but you see for example if you make this is just making a connection for example with fashion and how fashion affects a lot how we present uh, and how we we see um, ourselves so before uh, with rationalism and so for example the female body was was often represented as a classical classical beauty with uh, values of serenity maternity home uh, loving um, and then of course uh, this more ro romantic idea of, of the femme fatale uh, appeared uh, so uh, the representation of the female body related to picturesque and the ideas of exoticism and sin, carnal passion, danger and even um, death. And this was a romantic idea and it was particularly in England and in Germany that this uh, influence will be, would be most uh, felt, culminating in romanticism. So 
uh, here in Germany, of course, you are strongly influenced by this uh, romantic, romantic uh, spirit. Um, I mentioned this also because nowadays, of course, we we know from feminist studies that, of course, the female body and, a, and a, what it means to be a woman is much more complex between a duality uh, of being maternal or um, or uh, carnal or so or a femme fatale or a femme fragile so of course these divisions were created by men and uh, male representations and projections on on the female body but still this this was uh, what was represented through through art and for example now unfortunately we cannot do and make a visit but perhaps many of you were already um, at Staatsgalerie here in Stuttgart, where there is a very fine collection of, of uh, paintings uh, from uh, Romanticism and also from early Romanticism that you can see. Um, for example, there is this uh, painting, I'm sorry, I don't know, I don't remember the name of the author now, but it's the arrival of, of Cleopatra and you see how uh, the whole uh, scene of ancient Egypt is uh, is uh, staged with uh, Cleopatra uh, with very exotic uh, gear. Uh, but of course, we look at this painting as a as a as a as a painting which of, does not represent what was actually happening in ancient Egypt, but it shows much more. Of, of the thought of romantic period uh, it shows shows much more about about the end of the 18th century we will talk further more about uh, about romanticism um, so now we make a stop and uh, we talk about uh, Immanuel Kant and um, his text on the critique of pure reason and we bring Kant also in the context of uh, aesthetics. So the critique came as a natural reaction to Hume's empiricism, unfortunately without much consequence until the launching of the second edition where Kant himself would describe in the introduction that the matters there exposed were equivalent to the Copernical revolution. So Kant was very ambitious and wanted to make this statement that his proposal would completely change the game. Kant defies the notion of a priori knowledge, so the, the one we already have or are born with, not the tabula rasa, that, that's a different idea, but a priori is that what we already have or what we are born with, and stands for the hypothesis that the senses aren't just passive receptors of information, which is processed by the faculties of reason and imagination as knowledge meaning to the stimuli, but that perhaps the brain is already involved in absorbing or choosing which stimuli it gets from the environment and is involved in structuring these sensations before they become perceptions. In short, for Kant, it was possible that the perceived world is already made to conform to one's mind and to the way our brain organizes these sensations is determined by each individual's way of thinking. Which means that for Kant, what the senses receive are just appearances and do not correspond to a faithful representation of the outside world, so the brain shapes the world and orders it in two fundamental forms, space and time. That was for Kant. Kant would publish in 1790 his Critique of Judgment, where he gives a very small role to architecture, although he does talk about architecture, but affirms the same importance to space and time in the attribution of meaning to the sensible world, in the matter of appreciation of beauty, stating that the mind already brings something to the act of an aesthetic judgment. So when we make an aesthetic judgment, the mind is already bringing something to it. 
Another very important aspect regarding Kant's idea on the appreciation of beauty has to do with its sense of purposiveness. So for Kant, purposiveness is the idea of purpose. As Mal Malgrave, as I mentioned before, notes, purposiveness for Kant is, this is a citat from Malgrave, first of all, a subjective and heuristic principle, that is, it resides in our brains and therefore is not something that exists within the object and it has to be something that allows our feelings of pleasure or displeasure to take place. It is our implied trust that just as works of nature display all-encompassing formal unity and lawful regularity, whose design principles are accessible to our mental faculties, so too should works of art possess some kind of inner form that implicitly at least mirrors the principles of nature. So for Kant, we can already see that for him, this capacity to make a, a judgment is our implied trust that just as works of nature display all encompassing formal unity and lawful regularity, whose design principles are accessible to our mental faculties, so should works of art possess some kind of inner form that implicitly at least mirrors the principles of nature. This means, like before we had with Burke, that Kant really believed that there is something in the disposition of the brain which is already attracted to certain forms and to find them beautiful. And this would be his definition of purposiveness. So after thinking about this idea of Kantian aesthetics, we can think about the classical ideas of beauty and harmony, and we can think about Alberti, you know, Leo Battista Alberti, um, and his notion of consinitas. And probably, I don't know if you heard before about, uh, about Alberti, but for Alberti, consinitas aff uh, affirms the importance on architecture's capacity to seduce the eye, meaning the senses of the user, in by the way its parts fit together. So consinity, for Alberti, has to do not just with having beautiful aspects, but how these aspects come together as a whole. So Alberti's notion of consinitas uh, affirms the importance of architecture's capacity to seduce the eye of the user in, by the way, its parts fit together like a natural body which follows the laws of nature. Meaning that for Kant, it is the brain's own physiology that is responsible for aesthetical appreciation. So for Kant, basically, we are able to appreciate beauty because our minds are prepared for it. Our brain is prepared for it. Kant's ideas would be given even more credit and influence art by the middle of the 19th century, and especially by the end of the 20th century, when neuroscience started to address the problem of the brain with non-invasive research tools, not only for medical purposes, but also for understanding matters such as creativity, learning, and aesthetics. And this is where we will end uh, uh, our, our lessons. We will, we will arrive now at the discoveries of neuroscience and how neuroscience is already um, influencing um, architectural design. But before we follow to the next lesson, we have to refer that very important new technological developments were taking place since the second half of the 18th century. And this, of course, also influenced uh, how uh, Kant would arrive to this um, 
ideas on beauty. And innovations such as steam power, iron making and textiles would soon change radically our way of working and living and therefore recondition the body and architecture. So the appearance of new architectural um, typologies. So it was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, to give you the historical context, which would have its peak in the demographical explosions in the big cities during the 19th century. And we will continue with this on the next lesson. Thank you.